Moral Majority is not a religious organization. If it were, we could not get 72,000 pastors, which includes uh, Jews, Protestants, Catholics, Mormons, fundamentalists, etc., together without a blood battle. Uh, the fact is that uh, it's political. It's a very political organization, and one's membership is based upon citizenship in this country and a commitment to a pro-life, pro-traditional family, pro-moral, and pro-American uh, pro uh, position. The Supreme Court has drawn a line, the right of a woman to have control over her own body. I support the ruling and will enforce it to the best of my ability. I react. I react to the burning of the American flag. I react to the assassination attempts on the Constitution of the United States. I react to irresponsible voting in Congress, to the blatant compromise with communism, to prayer removed from our school. Brother, I'm ready to do something about it. Amen and amen. And we all made a commitment to God that, that day we, for the first time in our lives, we were going to get involved in the political process and do everything we could to wake up the Christians. So I stood there and I prayed this prayer. Uh, I said, oh God, we have got to get this man out of the White House and get someone in here who will be a, aggressive about bringing back traditional moral values. I happen to believe from all the study that I have been able to do, all the information I've been able to get, that when you interrupt a pregnancy, you are taking a human life. Now, that puts that human life within the protection of the Constitution, the guarantee of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In 1980, as evangelicals had thought four years before with Carter, a presidential candidate appeared to champion the evangelical cause. I was asked once what book I would choose if I were shipwrecked on an island and could have only one book for the rest of my life. I replied that I knew of only one book that could be read and reread and continue to be a challenge, the Bible. All the complex and horrendous questions confronting us at home and worldwide have their answer in that single book. I Reagan knew when he'd strike chords uh, in groups of people. He would talk about prayer in schools and uh, the, the values of uh, developing a welfare system which kept families together and, uh, and, uh, and reminding people that uh, this was one nation under God. In behalf of more than 30 million evangelical Christians in America, we welcome you to this one of the greatest assemblies in the 20th century, Governor Ronald Reagan. Someone said the, the leadership that was at that meeting represented between 50 and 60 million potential voters who were easy to register or registered. I mean, it was, it had the potential. They were there. I uh, suggested to Mr. Reagan that, that because it was a bipartisan, that it would be in his best interest, since we could not and would not endorse him as a body, that it would probably be wise if his opening comment would be, now, I know I this know is this a non -partisan is nonpartisan, so you and can't so endorse I know me. That you can't endorse me. But I want you to know I endorse I you. I only brought that up because I want you to know that I endorse you and what you are doing. Well, that headlined everywhere. I, you can't endorse me, I endorse you. Well, you can imagine what that did for me caring traditional value people thank you very much oh i'm just a flag waving american folks a citizen i'm really proud to be oh i'm just a flag waving american we have a threefold primary responsibility number one get people saved number two get them baptized number three get them registered to vote only 55 percent of evangelicals were registered to vote at that time the uh, national mean at the time was 72%. So we had a lot to do there. Who believes this land is the best beneath the sky? We had to learn the laws and how we could and where we could register. So 
We began registration efforts in church lobbies, on church lawns, whatever the particular state law was. Paul, how important is it for Christians to register to vote? Bill, outside of attaining eternal salvation, I can't think of anything that's more important right now. very survival of America is at stake. The secular humanists have been controlling things in Washington for a long time, and I think if Christians will get out there and register and vote, they still have the opportunity to turn it around, but soon it'll be too late. Oh, I'm just a flag waving American Who believes this land is the best beneath the sky And we registered about eight and a half million voters there in five years. Who believes this land is the best beneath the sky Lou Harris is one of the nation's leading pollsters, and I might add he is a Jewish individual. Uh, Lou Harris says this, Reagan is also winning the votes of that 26% of the white electorate who are followers of the evangelical preachers who have been active in the election. This group is providing Reagan with his clear margin in the election. You're seeing the president-elect of the United States and his family, Ronald and Nancy Reagan, the Reagan children and grandchildren. When Ronald Reagan was elected, 12 liberal senators unelected, and uh, the furor began, it was a feeling of elation. The fact is, as of this morning, we have a president-elect who is committed to help us pass a human life amendment through the Congress and the state legislatures. We have a president-elect who has said that we will help you return voluntary prayer to public schools. We have a president-elect who has said... We uh, thought we might be able to do something and did much more than we thought. We have a president-elect who has said, we, uh, I will work hard to return America to that position of number one in the world in military might for the cause of freedom and peace. And this, which no one gave us any hope for, but now as of this morning we have, we have a Senate and a House of Representatives committed to all those same positions to help us do it. A majority. As you go about forming your new government and selecting the people who are going to head the cabinet, be in your cabinet and run the government, how much consideration are you going to give to the advice of these new conservative organizations and the moral majority and uh, people like the Reverend Jerry Falwell? I am going to be open to these people. I, you are president of all the people, and I am going to want to uh, seek advice where I think that I can, it, uh, can get advice from those who are familiar with a particular problem. I'm not going to separate myself from the people who elected us and, and sent us there. There was only one priority in the first term, and that was the economy. And I would say to all of these department heads, Faith Wills, Elizabeth Dole, uh, Kenny Duberstein, whoever it was, unless you can show me how this thing plays to the economic recovery issue, I don't want to see it on my desk. So if you have a request from some religious organization to come in and talk to the president, and uh, that is one of the photo ops of the day, what's that got to do with turning the economy around, getting more jobs to the American people? From Washington, D.C., the Old Time Gospel Hour presents this special program with Jerry Falwell and President Ronald Reagan. Now, here is Jerry Falwell. This is the day Christians have longed and prayed for for a very, very long time. Today, our president is proposing a voluntary prayer amendment to the Constitution, which would once again allow the children of America to pray in the schoolrooms. I remember the first time I went to the White House with Jerry Falwell and ate at the mess hall. And Jerry Falwell and myself and two of the key people in the president's uh, inner circle eating lunch at this table discussing issues. I'm not thinking, wow, I am sitting here at the White House. Savoring the fruits of their labor, rejoicing in their proximity to power, evangelicals were about to get a hard lesson in political reality. 
In the U.S. Senate tonight, the vote is in on a constitutional amendment that would allow prayer said out loud in public schools. President Reagan was pushing hard for this amendment, but it was defeated, falling well short of the two-thirds vote needed for passage. Yes, there was an effort, and I believe the president was committed, but arguments were made to him that other things were more important at the time. I know full well that a, an administration that was, was more... Uh, composed of a greater percentage of traditional values conservatives who had a real enthusiasm about this would have figured out ways to bring it up again and again and change it a little bit and bring it up again um, but there there wasn't the will to go through that process more than once when mr. Lincoln said we may very well self-destruct you don't have to look too long to see the possibility of it today after all, if we can just keep getting more of our men to have sex with more men, we won't have to worry about babies being born. And if we can just get more women to get out there in the marketplace and start acting like men, and if we can just get other women to look at motherhood as though it is some dread terminal illness, if we can just get society so drunk and so drugged, if ever anybody does get pregnant, then we can abort the baby. That's where we are. The inspiration for the Rally for Life was President Ronald Reagan's nomination of Arizona Judge Sandra O'Connor to the Supreme Court. The religious right is attacking her legislative record as pro-abortion. The right to life people oppose her, sir, and we just wonder if... Uh... All of those questions this Attorney General is prepared to answer. Well, Mr. President, you have such a firm position on that. Can you give us yes. your feelings about her position? I am completely satisfied. On her right to life position? Yes. I was uh, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina with my family on vacation when a, uh, the phone rang in the uh, condo that we had uh, leased for that week. It was Ronald Reagan. And he said, Jerry, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to nominate Sandra Day O'Connor to the Supreme Court. Uh, we've done a pretty good background study. We feel very strongly that she does represent the views and values that I campaigned on and became president on. And I would simply ask you if you would uh, give us a little time to develop that through the hearings and so forth before taking a position. And I agreed to that, and it did in fact uh, keep quiet. The timing of the appointment of Judge O'Connor was rushed up by a day or two in order to head off right-wing opposition to her. The president's advisors have been focusing on her for more than a month. But after a news report last week made that public, Right to Life and other far-right conservative groups began to attack her pro-abortion voting record in the Arizona State Senate. And uh, once uh, she was uh, examined, became one of her supporters, and still am. One of the realities of politics is you can choose, and I'll use a biblical paradigm, you can choose either to be an advisor or a prophet. If you choose to be a prophet, then you don't have a lot of influence on the political reality. But you're always free to speak what you perceive to be the truth for the current historical moment. Or you can be an advisor with a sense of truth, a sense of value, but your objective simply to influence the process. And I think the moral majority move from a prophetic role into more an advisor role and lost some of its ability to speak against even the administration it was for. In your conversations with the president, did he specifically ask you not to take a stand on the O'Connor nomination until after the Senate hearings? Uh, as I recall the conversation, he gave me all the information he did have on Judge O'Connor. Well, at that time it was very limited. I gave to him what had come to me also very limited. And uh, uh, he, uh, and in the process of the conversation, I don't know if he asked me or if I said, well, the only commitment I can make is, and it's a fair one, I will wait till all the, the facts are in and the hearings are concluded before then reaching a conclusion. And um, I think we had a very charitable phone call on the subject. And I think the moral majority chose the advisor role, which is the danger of politics, that once they invite you up to the big house, then uh, you got to go by the rules of the big house.